All right. Well, good afternoon to the folks, at least the folks on the East Coast. Uh, Brandy Garrett here with the National Minority Equality Forum. Uh, about to get it, start the program on telehealth this week. It'll be led by our NMQF's very own Christina Edwards, who's our clinical trial director. Um, before I um, turn it over to her, I wanted to just do a couple of housekeeping announcements and announcements in general. One, if you have questions um, that you want to be asked, uh, please use the Q&A box. And then we also have a chat feature right now if something moves you and you want to share it um, with the uh, fellow folks that are listening to it um, or participating in the program. Uh, so that's one about this. Two, our uh, 21st annual Summit on Health Disparities is coming up April 17th and 18th, 2023 in Washington, D.C. at the Watergate Hotel, and that's on our website, as well as the 40 under 40 applications, which are going to be due in early February. So if you know anyone um, in the health minority in the healthcare space, I encourage them to apply. And then finally, and I'm going to hurry up because I know Christine is ready to get started. Uh, I have to give a shout out to my niece, who the reason I couldn't be here last weekend because she just graduated. Naya Silv Jones uh, graduated from Prairie View A&M University in Prairie View, Texas, uh, magna cum laude. So I was a thank the laude. She's a magna, and so we're we're doing better each generation, and I guess that's what's most important. And without further ado, I want to turn it over to Christina. Hello, everyone. Um, I want to welcome you all to today's uh, webinar, and thank you for joining us today. Um, so today we'll be discussing the title here is Telehealth and Health Equity, Finding a Patient-Focused Balance. I'm Christina Edwards. I am the Clinical Trial Director at the National Minority Quality, Quality Forum, excuse me, and I will serve as your moderator for today's discussion which we will focus on the impact of telehealth policy during the COVID-19 pandemic, the challenges in the current policy landscape, as well as the outlook for the future of telehealth. Um, a quick little synopsis of myself, my role as a clinical trial director at NMQF is primarily on the Alliance for Representative Clinical Trials, or ARC for short, it is a multi-sponsor public-private program, essentially organized to diversify and bring clinical trials to communities of color and other communities that have been essentially underrepresented in clinical trials. Um, as this relates to telehealth, we've seen the rise in telehealth and clinical research during the height of the COVID-19 um, epidemic. Many trials were either put on hold, but as we know, we didn't have that luxury for all trials, certain oncology trials, for example, um, which were forced into the emergence of DCTs, decentralized clinical trials or hybrid trials. Um, and we've seen how telehealth was able to contribute to that and to help diversify in that space, specifically where access to healthcare is limited due to geographic barriers, you know, like remote areas, and also where access is limited due to the populations, impoverished populations in those communities, underserved, underrepresented, um, just limited access, um, whether that be for transportation, childcare, um, and um, the social determinants of health are endless with that situation. Um, so telehealth did give the opportunity and can give the opportunity to these patients to still participate in clinical trials without having to physically be present in an office setting. Um, so we received some feedback today about the timelines of today's topic. So we're looking forward to a robust conversation with our panelists who have deep policy, academic, and real world expertise in telehealth and health equity. Um, as Garen may have mentioned before, again, um, just want to for our housekeep, excuse me, housekeeping for our attendees. Um, you are at your leisure. You can enter any questions, comments into the Q&A box. Um, just to feel free to keep the comment, conversation going in the chat or share where you're joining us from as well. Um, so I, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers for today. Um, they're going to have a brief introduction to our panelists. They'll share a bit more about the work that they are doing before we get into the questions for discussion. So I'm pleased to introduce to you Eric Gasho, Senior Vice President of Policy and Government Affairs at the National Health Council. A little bit about Eric. Eric has been with the National Health Council since August 2009, where he leads the National Health Council advocacy efforts by working with his member organizations who develop policy positions that seek to improve the lives of people with chronic diseases and disabilities 
and advocating for these policies on Capitol Hill and within the executive branch. In recent years, under Eric's leadership, the National Health Council Policy and Government Affairs team has completed significant work and thought leadership in that area of health equity, diversity, and inclusion, as well as telehealth and its impact on patients. Um, I'd like to work for Eric, and thank you for your time today, Eric. And Dr. Tracy, our program coordinator for the Psychiatric Mental Health Nurse Practitioner Program at Texas Christian University and owner of the C Trilogy Comprehensive Care. Um, Dr. Hicks is a dual certified APRN in family practice and psychiatric mental health. She promotes education on addiction and care of those living with HIV AIDS and hepatitis C. And with the comprehensive care model, she also addresses the mental health and primary health care needs. Her nonprofit, c Trilogy Outreach, has been awarded um, the SAM HSA Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic Plan and Development and Implementation Grant in 2020. And her goal is to improve care in desperate and marginalized populations. And Dr. Hicks, would you like to tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So it was an it's an absolute pleasure to be here with you um, today, everyone, and thank you for the gift of your time. And I did put together um, a brief PowerPoint um, for your information on the uh, certified community behavioral health clinic model. Um, I have both personal and professional experience um, in the mental health space and also primary care. Um, so this having this opportunity meant so much means so much to me and um, I'm happy to be able to expand access to care and our population so I'll get started share my screen. All right. So the certified community behavior health clinic expansion grant is for planning develop development and implementation of the CCBHC model. And uh, this is the Trilogy Outreach. So in, I've been in practice since 2016 in private practice and it was C-Trilogy Comprehensive Clinical Care. And then I um, established a nonprofit in 2020 um, to uh, focus on um, funding and um, getting help for the people in my community that were needing a holistic care model. So we call this Project Holistic Health and Equity, short HHE. It has a staunch focus on social determinants of health and diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. So the CCBHC model, the grantees are closing the treatment gap that leaves millions of Americans with unmet mental health and substance use needs, bringing thousands of new clients into care. 1.2 million people are currently served across 249 responding clinics, which means that an estimated 2.1 million people are ser served nationwide by 450 CCBHCs. And C Trilogy is honored to be a part of this initiative and grantees active as of August of uh, 2022. This estimated total represents an increase of about 600,000 clients compared to the estimated total number of individuals served by CCBHCs in 2021. So we're already seeing advantages and increases. So CCBHCs and grantees are on average serving more than 900 more people per clinic than prior CCBHC implementation, representing a 23% increase. This is wonderful. So the purpose is to enhance C-Trilogy's efforts in increasing access to and improve the quality of community mental health and substance use disorder treatment services. To implement access to services, including mental health, substance abuse, and primary care services, including a mobile 24-hour crisis intervention unit. So what are these core services? There are nine specific services that CCBHCs can provide targeted case management, crisis services, outpatient primary care and screening and monitoring, peer support, counseling, and family support using a holistic model, psychiatric rehabilitation services, screening assessment and diagnosis, intensive health care for veterans, patient-centered treatment planning, which is very important for health equity, outpatient mental health and substance use services. We expand access to care, we invest in the workforce, 
expand access to medication assisted treatment or better known as MAT for opioid use disorder, coordination and integration with primary care, which is very important, making crisis services and supports available to all, improving collaboration with the criminal justice agencies, meeting children, youth and families where they are, which is very important as well, and overall addressing health disparities. So some general information, Funding was by the Center, of Mental, Center for Mental Health Services. I am the project director of this grant. And it's a four year funding period from nine, uh, September 30, 2022 through September 29, 2026. So our population of focus is adults 18 and older with serious mental illness, youth with serious emotional disturbances, individuals, individuals with substance use disorder and individuals with co-occurring disorders. We are located in Longview, Gregg County, the most populous county in the region, but we do serve counties outside of that area. So the implementation approach, we plan to implement Project Holistic Health and Equity, HHE, to enhance its ability to provide access to comprehensive, integrated co and co-located collection of services that stabilize people in crisis and provide treatment recovery support services for those with the most serious and complex, complex mental and substance use disorder, regardless of their ability to pay or place of residence. C-Trilogy will accomplish this by onboarding a project director, which is myself, a medical director, external evaluator, and strengthening its current partnership with the Texas Health and Human Services Commission, the state's behavioral health authority, and the Medicaid office. So, Project HHE will use the Crisis Intervention Treatment Programs, a best practice guide for transforming community responses to mental health crisis. We will have a 24-hour mobile crisis team, or better known as MCOT, and we'll establish a 24-hour hotline that community, that community and providers can call to access mobile crisis services. MAT services will be, be delivered by a direct care organization, which is East Texas Clinic, and will also be offered in-house at C-Trilogy Outreach. So some of the evidence-based practices, practices that we will utilize is the matrix model, cognitive behavioral therapy, assertive community treatment, integrated dual, dual diagnosis treatment, and seeking safety, among others. So the assertive community treatment model, this is bringing uh, the services to people where they are. It's a model for people with severe mental illness who are at most risk for homelessness, psychiatric crisis and hospitalizations, and involvement in the criminal justice system. So we will use those nine core uh, support systems or services on the CCBH model. So what do we expect to achieve the outcomes? If successfully executed, which we plan to do so, the following outcomes are to be expected by the end of the funding period a 40% decrease in mental health symptoms, a minimum of 50% compliance with treatment regimens, 25% decrease in ER visits, 30% decrease in incarcerations, 60% decrease in substance use, and 100% of clients will receive coordinated, co-located and integrated services with at least 90% satisfaction. So I think we'll save our questions to the latter part of the hour. And again, thank you for your time. And that was a brief overview of the CCBHC model. Yes, well, all, you all will have um, an opportunity towards the end of this call to ask uh, Dr. Hicks any questions. Um, hearing about your grant funding, we did receive a registrant question about funding resources to address the feasibility of implementing telehealth in the community. So it is great to hear firsthand from someone who's received a grant you know, to help further your work. Um, next, we have Eric. Uh, we'll hear more about his work with telehealth and health equity at the National Health Council. Great, thank you so much. Um, let me share my slides. Okay, great. Um, so thank you so much to the National Minority Quality Forum, not only for having me here today to, to speak to the um, attendees, um, but certainly for all of your uh, partnership that we've shared over the years. Uh, Dr. Puckrin serves on the board of directors for the National Health Council, and you all have been a, a wonderful partner in really pushing the patient advocacy community um, towards really focusing in on, on health equity and reducing health disparities, and so really enjoyed the work that we've done over the years. 
Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the, the work that we've done around telehealth as it relates to public policy and specifically on um, some of the listening sessions that we did with our member patient advocacy organizations um, over the years. Um, so as we saw a, a huge rise in the use of telehealth um, in the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic as um, the government uh, uh, released uh, and loosened a few restrictions that have been in place to really make sure people could access care during the pandemic, um, we did see a lot of uh, great benefits uh, within the chronic disease community for people accessing care, um, but really did also start to um, illuminate um, some potential pitfalls and things that we really want to make sure as we think about uh, the future permanent role of telehealth in our healthcare system, um, focusing on some of those things that we need to make sure that we structure it um, in the most um, uh, the most appropriate way possible. So. Um, real quickly, um, we did a number of listening sessions with um, patient advocacy organizations to hear what they were hearing from the people that they serve about um, some of the benefits they've seen from, um, from telehealth and some of the things that they really wanted to make sure we were considering as we uh, move forward into, uh, into the, the new paradigm of healthcare delivery. Um, so we um, see on the next slide here. Um, these are the groups that we talked to. Um, so we made sure we had a, a sort of um, a broad based approach to um, people who represent uh, folks with different chronic diseases and disabilities. Um, so um, one's focused in on uh, mental health, on autoimmune conditions, on um, asthma, on kidney disease. So really looking at a, a broad spectrum of people who have been who had um, utilized telehealth during the pandemic. Um, so what did we learn? Um, so uh, walk through a couple of quick slides on um, some of the, the key findings from this. Um, one was that the, probably the overarching thing that we heard and continue to focus on is that we really need to make sure we're structuring a system where the patient and provider can jointly decide what is the right avenue for them to, um, to ha have care delivered. Um, it's going to depend on a, a number of different preferences and, and uh, considerations based on individual patients. Um, first is on uh, disease characteristics. Um, you know, depending on what your condition is or what the, the nature of your visit is, um, sometimes telehealth is going to be um, just fine um, and, and you can benefit from the, the convenience um, that, that comes with it. Um, you know, one thing that we heard from someone um, representing folks with skin conditions is if you have it presenting on your hands, um, doing something over telehealth might be fine. But if it's on your legs, a little bit harder to put that in front of the camera. So really thinking about um, kind of what are the, the unique um, uh, and specific things to each individual um, really needs to be considered. Um, similarly, when we think about, um, particularly in the disability community, um, a patient's mobility. They may benefit greatly um, from, the, from the ability to see their provider of a telehealth, depending on the, the nature of the visit, um, if it is just um, difficult to travel to the office. Um, so that's something to think about as well. Uh, but at the same time, um, we really want to make sure that providers are not um, you know, using that as a reason not to um, invest in accessible exam tables and things of that nature. So really thinking about um, sort of both sides of the coin. Um, next, uh, geography is certainly a, a big element uh, when it comes to making uh, the decision. Um, you know, unfortunately, um, I don't have to tell people uh, on this call, I think everyone knows well enough that um, we don't always have enough providers in different places where people need them. Um, so it's fantastic to hear the work that, uh, that Dr. Hicks is doing. Um, but uh, for some people, um, it may be um, that they are not in a place where they um, uh, have easy access to a provider. You may live in a, a rural area. You may, you may be someone like me who lives in uh, Washington, D.C., who doesn't have a car um, and would have to take um, the bus or the metro to get to a provider and take a lot of time out of my day to do it. Um, if it's a, a quick visit that can be done over telehealth, um, maybe um, uh, better for, for me and for people in that, in that position. Um, also really focusing on the need for privacy. This was one that we, we heard a lot about as well. Um, you may be um, someone who um, wants to go see your provider in person because you don't have a quiet space or a private space in your own home uh, to talk to your provider. Um, one example that we heard is, um, you know, someone who may be a, a victim of domestic violence um, and not wanting to talk to their uh, mental health pr practitioner or their uh, other providers um, in the next room over from uh, from their partner and their abuser. So. Um, you know, really want to make sure that, you know, these are things that can be considered when making those decisions as well. 
Um, next, we, we really explored um, sort of what the future of telehealth looks like and what do we need to do to make sure that we are um, uh, setting up a system um, and, and setting up technology platforms that make the most sense for, uh, for the people who will utilize them. A um, couple of things that we heard. Um, one, we really want to make sure that any new platforms that are being developed um, are being designed and tested with um, the people who will benefit and really looking at a diverse population of the people who will benefit from them as well. Um, second is making sure that we have the system in place that um, for those who have a, um, uh, a family caregiver or someone who's really helping them manage their care, um, that they can join, even if they're not in the same location. Um, so really uh, potentially setting up that um, uh, two-way or that, that three-way communication uh, possibility. Um, we want to make sure that um, platforms um, can be done in multiple languages. Um, so you may be someone who um, has a provider who um, speaks your preferred language, but the login instructions to get to that provider may only be in English. Um, and so I think we really need to think about from the um, sort of very beginning of the visit, um, getting on to the getting into the virtual exam room um, is, is done in a way that people um, have access to it. Um, and then last, we heard that uh, depending on the, the condition, depending on the type of visit, um, some people uh, really benefited from audio-only telehealth as well. Um, so this is uh, being able to use a, a, a phone uh, to call a provider and talk to them rather than having to have um, access to broadband and a, a laptop with a camera. Um, being able to do um, some services over the phone um, can be a benefit. Um, you might be someone who lives in a, a rural area who uh, lacks broadband. Uh, you may be someone of um, uh, of lesser economic means who uh, doesn't want to use as much data uh, if you're paying uh, by the by the data as well. Um, so um, having that that opportunity um, is something that we found that people benefited from as well. Um, and last but absolutely not least, we really want to be um, thoughtful and mindful of what the role telehealth can be in terms of both eliminating health disparities as well as further perpetuating them. Um, so you know, I've talked a little bit about um, uh, uh, broadband access. Um, you know, we don't want to be setting up a system where um, we may be um, inadvertently um, steering people towards uh, places where they can only access healthcare through telehealth and they don't have access to broadband or it's going to um, cost them more money than transportation will. Um, so, you know, thinking about those things as well. Um, there's also a, a, a potential to um, really focus in on um, uh, on the social drivers of health. So if someone um, lacks adequate transportation or it's going to be very uh, time uh, time intensive and have to take more time off of work if you're an hourly employee, um, there can be great benefits to it as well. Um, one other sort of social driver of health um, type of thing, that a great example that we heard was, um, you know, there was a, an asthma patient who did a telehealth visit and the provider um, could see very clearly in a person's home that they had mold on their carpet. Um, that was one thing that was probably very much driving further exacerbation of their asthma. And there are things that maybe providers don't actually ask those questions in the clinic. So there's potential um, great benefits here as it relates to um, uh, health equity. Um, but again, we really need to make sure that we're not um, sort of steering people one way or the other in places that don't make sense for them and their provider because um, we think there's a, a great chance that this could further perpetuate them as well. So um, really thinking about sort of the long-term role, one of the guiding principles absolutely has to be how can we use um, uh, telehealth to, to, to drive better outcomes and to drive better outcomes equitably across our population. So um, I'll stop there. Um, I know uh, there's a number of questions that we want to get to and certainly hope to see more pop up in the chat as well. Thank you, Eric. Um, so, but before we get to those questions, we want to engage the attendees a little bit. Um, so we have a poll question for you. Um, it is a poll question about telehealth. Um, you should see it pop up on your screen. Um, so would you prefer to visit your healthcare provider in person, virtually via telehealth, or would it depend on the reason for the appointment? We have our options here in person, via a telehealth platform, it depends on the reason for the appointment.
Um, so while we give our audience a few minutes to respond, I'd like to ask Dr. Eric and Dr. Hicks, do you have a preference for this question? What, what, what's your response? So I, I would say that it, it depends on the reason for the appointment. But if I had to pick one, I would pick telehealth because I do like to have, having that option when you're talking about time management. How about you, Eric? I think of the uh, would say the exact same thing. Um, I've certainly uh, utilized it um, more over the, the past few years. Um, but I also will say that um, I very mm -hmm. purposefully um, picked my uh, my doctor to be near my office. And so if it's a day that I um, am, am working from the office, might want to go in person. But the day that I'm working from home, might want to go over telehealth. So it really kind mm -hmm. of depends and, and for many reasons. Yeah, I'm leading more to depends. It just depends on the nature of the of the visit. I haven't, my experience with telehealth thus far has been a quick audio only um, situation with a physician. So I have yet to, you know, experience the full, full on visit, visual, you know, video conference with the physician. But I think it just depends on the nature of conversation. I'm into face-to-face -face interaction. I don't do self-checkout. <laughs> I go to the register. You know, I'm just, that's that's my role. Well, I can say you can you can come and see me. It'll be a really lengthy <laughs> visit for you. <laughs> um, so I think we're still polling. Okay, so we have some results. Um, thirteen percent in person, four percent via a telehealth platform. Uh, majority of you all are going, but it just depends on the reason for the appointment. Makes sense. Um, there's certainly a benefit to the in-person appointment if it's your first visit to a new provider or if it's a serious health concern, or maybe there's more privacy in the provider's office than at home or wherever a person would need to conduct a health, telehealth visit. Um, so we'll keep this in mind as we move on to some questions for our panelists. Um, so we're gonna go ahead with gen some general telehealth pros and cons. Um, for Dr. Hicks, I'll start with you. In your clinical experience, excuse me, in what ways have increased access to telehealth, telehealth during the pandemic enhanced health equity? Well, thank you for that question. And I'll say that before the pandemic, um, my um, clients, or you may hear me say clients or patients interchangeably, they were already asking about um, telehealth options. So it was already in the back of my mind. So when we when the pandemic hit, I just had to push that button to get it started. But I will say that I do establish an individualistic approach with my clients. And like Eric mentioned earlier, a prime example would be someone with um, you know, it, um, an issue with domestic violence. It may not be optimal for them to be to do the visit at home. So you have to um, consider what's right for the, the patient or the client. So what I've done is had that conversation firsthand. Um, with my front desk and staff that, you know, they ask about the preference and, and we have a strong preference for the first visit, visit being in person. So we can, we can get that baseline data, but there are extenuating circumstances where that's not always possible. Okay. That kind of ties into the next question. You know, how do you determine uh, when telehealth versus in-person care is most appropriate? So if they're if they're having some you know acute issues that we need to have them to come in and we need to do a visual or there's some testing that needs to be done that we can't arrange for it to be done outside the office those are instances where we would have to have that in person visit but again that's a conversation and that's that's where you have to look at those social determinants of health or social drivers of health how can we help them be successful and how can we team up with them to to make this um, visit um, optimal and have optimal outcomes. Um, is there, in your um, experience, what is missed if a person receives healthcare only through, um, let's say, a Zoom platform so or you, audio oh, okay. only or so either of those? That, that, that visual aspect of the patient. 
But again, those things can be addressed. Um, like if I have a patient that there are some extenuating circumstances where they can't come in, um, we do, I ask them to, to see if they can have a family member present, someone that they're okay with having involved in their visit. That way that, you know, if we're doing a virtual visit, we can do a, a body scan or if they have home health, there's several options that you can consider, but it takes a little time or case management to get that done. But for instance, I had a client who has home health. So we tried to arrange the visit around when the home health nurse would be there. And so she could help with the vital signs and do that. But again, there are circumstances where that we, you know, we have to have them come in. Um, Eric, we have some questions for you as well. Um, so patient preference and satisfaction, excuse me, satisfaction is, of course, incredibly important to equitable health care delivery. Um, so during the pandemic, many patients have realized that they prefer to use telehealth when possible. Um, as Dr. Hicks discussed already, telehealth isn't always the optimal setting of care from a quality perspective. In your view as a patient advocate, what is the best approach to preserving patient choice while also ensuring high quality, safe, effective care. Um, what role can public policy, for example, Medicare, Medicaid payment policy play a role in striking this balance? Sure, and I'll, I'll start by saying, I don't think we're gonna be able to uh, completely solve the problem through public policy um, and through payment policy. I think it's really important to make sure we get all of that um, done well, but I think there's a lot as it relates to just the general practice of medicine um, that I think we really need to think about how we're um, empowering patients and providers to um, you know, make those choices. But it has to be a choice that that, that has to be an equal choice um, based on some of the, the sort of groundwork that we lay. Um, so when we think about things like uh, Medicare and Medicaid policy, really making sure that we're not um, overly incentivizing one or the other. Um, and, you know, even if you have a, a you know, an equal uh, payment for both, but it's um, seen as less expensive uh, to administer one or the other, that may sort of um, kind of push um, people in, into one direction or the other. So really making sure that we um, sort of strike that right balance um, so that we um, really are making it a, an equal choice for patients and providers would be really important. Um, I think another thing uh, to really think about is, is we want to um, kind of think about how we're ensuring that everyone can benefit um, from changes that we've seen uh, from policy um, is, you know, making sure that we're investing in broadband, um, that we are um, investing in programs that make broadband more affordable. Um, we're really pleased to see um, kind of both of those uh, areas addressed by the bipartisan infrastructure bill um, last year. Um, so I think it's really important that we're uh, making sure that we're um, kind of sharing the, the benefit of this um, uh, equitably across the country. Sounds good. <clears throat> so in addition to the quality of care, there's also concern about creating a two-tier system. Um, so what do you think about that? While expansion of telehealth during the pandemic, it's helped to address longstanding access barriers. Some experts have expressed concerns that continued telehealth expansion could lead to a two-tier system where some patients have difficulty access, accessing in-person care when they need it and instead are relegated to telehealth. Um, emerging from the pandemic, how do we avoid the inadvertent worsening of existing inequities regarding telehealth? Yeah, and I think we want to make sure we're not doing um, sort of one or the other in terms of, of kind of creating that system that push people towards telehealth or creating that system that make it difficult to access it through telehealth. So again, it's really about um, sort of striking the right balance, um, you know, come back to um, some of the, uh, the uh, public policy changes and looking at, at payment to make sure that we are um, not uh, inadvertently creating that system. Um, you know, it's it's going to all about the incentives. Um, so making sure that we're not um, overly incentivizing uh, one or the other. Um, the other thing that I'll really um, would want to stress is that I do think that um, you know we've seen a, a huge amount of innovation in this area over the the past few years. Um, and um, clinical practice guidelines for providers don't always keep pace with emerging um, innovation and technology as we've often seen, not just with telehealth, but elsewhere. And so, you know, for those of you who may be on here that um, are in any um, place to uh, influence cl clinical practice guidelines, I would recommend that that's something um, that really goes towards the front of the list to really think about 
um, you know, how are providers um, in, a, in a routine interaction um, really equipped to have that conversation with their patient to decide uh, what is the, um, um, uh, the best method of, uh, of care delivery for any individual interaction. So I think that there's a, a real need there. Um, I think similarly, um, as we think about um, uh, educating uh, the providers of the future, um, really equipping them, uh, not only, you know, probably younger people in med school now are pretty, uh, pretty comfortable with the technology, um, but I think really making sure that they're also equipped to have those types of conversations with their patients um, to really co-develop their care plan just more broadly, but and specifically um, as it relates to um, determining the best um, uh, setting for their care. Great insight. I know as we strive to make access to healthcare easier for all, we just certainly want to be mindful of any issues it may cause, um, which is why diversity is so important. Having people of all backgrounds at the table when these important decisions are made fosters um, certainly a more inclusive system. Um, so we'll move on to our Q&A part of our webinar. And I'd like to remind everyone to please enter your questions into the but please feel free to keep the discussion and comments going in the chat box as well. Um, so we received a few questions from our registrants um, that we'll get to first. Um, either uh, Dr. Hicks or Eric, you're free to respond. When it comes to telehealth, how do we ensure that the patient and provider relationship remains primary and telehealth is a good adjunct without relegating patients to lower quality care? Um, I can start and just uh, probably re reiterate a couple of the, the points that I made earlier. Um, I think, again, making sure that we sort of um, craft those policies to make sure that they are um, kind of uh, equal choice when it comes to any of the incentives that are in place. Um, and again, um, you know, really making sure that we are equipping um, not only providers, but patients to um, be their own best advocates and say, um, you know, this is the type of um, a visit that I want to have, whether it be telehealth or um, uh, or in person visit. Um, I would certainly agree with that, Eric. I think establishing a partnership, empowering the the patient or the client at the at the onset of the the relationship is very important. And it's like Eric said, what type of um, experience would you like this to be, and see you know how we can both work to meet those needs. Thank you. Um, so we touched on this a little bit earlier, um, but audio um, telehealth, can you speak to the pros and cons of audio only telehealth specifically, anything that stands out to you in your view, what is the future role for audio only telehealth compared to audio video telehealth and in-person care? So in, in my experience, audio, the obvious, you can't see the patient. But, you know, with in the mental health space, not to divert, but in the mental health space, sometimes um, that is more feasible for the, the patient. But you have to really do an in-depth assessment. It's kind of like I picked on you earlier and said it would be a, a longer, more in-depth visit if it's audio. And then you have to listen to those cues in there to say, OK, hey, do we need to get this client to come in? Do I need to send help? You know, what do I need to do in this case? Yeah, and I, I think that there are certainly um, uh, pros and cons. I think, and it, it certainly depends on uh, the type of visit. If it's you know someone who's uh, talking to a uh, therapist for, for talk therapy, can be a great benefit. Um, you know, not only for people who don't have access to the the equipment or broadband, but maybe for people who might be um, a little bit older and less comfortable with that technology um, and would have a much easier time picking up the phone. Um, rather than um, having to, to learn how to do it on the computer. Um, one thing that I would also highlight is I think we need to have a better um, understanding of what constitutes an audio-only visit. Um, one of the things that we did here in our um, listening sessions was that um, there were some people who um, called their doctor's office to fill a prescription or to do something that was kind of more of a um, you know, a thing that they would typically do before um, uh, a lot of these restrictions were lifted, and they got charged to copay for it. Um, so I think that it's important that we really constitute what's sort of a routine call to, you know, some of the support staff, what is um, an actual audio only visit, um, so that people aren't 
um, surprised when they get a, um, you know, a, they get a 15 or $20 copay um, sent to, um, bill sent to them in the mail. And that's the next funny you mentioned that. <laughs> I'm fighting a 30 second call from a physician that I have a copay for <laughs> right now. Yeah, these are things that probably yeah. wouldn't have happened before we um, changed the rules around it. Yeah, it should be a visit that is is in depth enough to where if something were to occur, if something was awry, you could say, okay, I need more information or I need you to come in for a follow up visit. Same visit format for me as it is for a, a virtual or an in person visit. Um, I'll divert to a question related that's in the chat. Um, are there any partnerships with telephone internet companies that can make access in the internet or phones? cheaper for some patients who can't afford it? Is that um, happening or? I do see that there's a response to that in the chat as well about the affordable connectivity program. Um, so I sort of alluded to this a little bit earlier um, as part of the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill. Um, you know, there there is um, there is money from the government um, that's going out to um, institute this program to help make it more affordable. Will it be enough? Probably not, um, but I do think um, it's, it's a good start. Um, and I was really um, pleased to see that it wasn't, the discussion wasn't only about just, you know, putting the pipes in the ground and, and making it um, easier for people to plug into them, um, but really thinking about what the um, actual, what access to broadband means, uh, which certainly is driven by uh, people's ability to afford it as well. Um, okay, in your experience in the background of, um, your respective companies, has there been talks on how to provide gender and race sensitive telehealth care? Well, I can say yes in my space. Um, I try when I'm when I'm doing telehealth, for me, it it should be as close to an in-person visit as possible. You know, same information, same respect, same preferences for the patient. Again, it goes back to having that conversation and partnership with the patient. So the same entry, are you in a private space? Um, you know, that same uh, language that I do at the beginning of the visit um, about privacy issues, confidentiality, and when I would have to notify help. So same premise for telehealth. We are having those discussions, so nothing changes. Yeah, I think that's, I would completely agree. Um, and one thing to add on to that, I think where there may be a little bit of an additional need um, within a telehealth environment would be, you know, if, if a uh, provider is um, now, you know, for lack of a better term, in the in the patient's home and kind of seeing um, what's around them, I think there's really an even uh, greater need to really focus on things like addressing unconscious bias and and making sure that that doesn't also um, affect the the care that they're delivering. Um, but overall, I would say I completely agree that it should be as close to in person as possible. Um, kind of to help us segue into our next question regarding the home. Do you have any thoughts specific to home visiting and telehealth? So for home visits, you mean combining the two or? Um, so the post-pandemic policy is being developed and there is conflicting arguments for or against allowing telehealth for um, the program centered around home visits, excuse me, home visits um, during the pandemic. Yeah, and I do remember seeing this question when it came in. So I think it's a, a, um, a organization is thinking about expanding some of their um, their um, home visit programs into telehealth. And without knowing a little bit more about sort of, you know, what their patient population looks like, what the services they provide are, I think it's um, difficult to, to answer it with any specificity. Um, my number one recommendation would be, um, you know, don't ask us this question, ask the patients that you serve. Um, I think that would be um, a really good first step is to really hear what they want um, uh, based on sort of wh where they are in the country, what types of services they provide, um, you know, the, the sort of the makeup of their population, I think will, will tell them a lot. Um, but by and large, I think, um, you know, creating more options is probably a good thing. Um, but in terms of whether or not it's going to be um, worth the investment, um, I think really uh, may depend on um, sort of what they think the demand is from their own population. Yeah, we have to view it as more of a holistic approach, like 
we're not doing this to save time, so to speak. We're making sure we're meeting the patient's need in whatever avenue we take. Okay. Um, so we have another one here. What policies are needed to help low-income patients who don't have reliable internet, cellular data access, telehealth? Um, and same for uh, language access services for LEP patients. Yeah, I think back to um, the affordable connectivity program, I think um, really um, continuing to, to put funding into that program, I think will, will be helpful. Um, I think um, for folks who um, lack broadband, depending on what the, um, the service is, um, audio only, um, allowing for that um, may be helpful. Um, on the um, low English, low English proficiency, um, you know, I'll, I'll come back to one of the things that we had heard is really making sure that the platforms are um, established in a way um, that are in multiple languages that people will be able to actually um, utilize them and get into the uh, the virtual exam room, um, I think will be really important. And, and having those types of um, navigation services um, available, um, I think will be um, crucial as well. I know there's tele teleinterpreter companies. Um, oh, yes. Uh, fr a friend of mine works for a community health center in DC. They're looking at um, doing um, some expansion of some of their um, assistance programs they have, like helping people get to transportation, um, uh, things of that nature, and kind of bringing that into um, a virtual environment as well. Okay, I'm going to venture into the Q&A box. Um, it says here, how are you addressing telehealth issues in the care of individuals who are deaf, hard of hearing, blind, or have intellectual cognitive disability? Well, I would say using uh, technologies and services that are available for the disabled and um, disabled um, patients that we serve. So um, utilizing technology. So we are in the infancy of development. So those are things we are looking at. And that was one of the things that was mentioned and addressed in our focus groups. So we are reaching out to different um, agencies to get that into place. But yes, their technology is advancing and we're looking at researching to take advantage of that. Yeah, I think just really making sure that, um, you know, it's very similar to, to thinking about uh, making sure that the, the platforms are accessible to people with limited English making sure that they're accessible to people with um, any any type of disability. Um, so really making sure that, um, you know, this is obviously would, would not be a place where audio only would work well for people who are, are deaf. So making sure that we're um, putting people into, um, uh, you know, video services that are gonna have um, a, a sign language interpreter um, or closed captioning, um, really making sure that we're um, focused in on the, the individual needs of uh, individual patients or if, they're not able to utilize telehealth, um, uh, making sure that they have the ability to um, see their provider in person. Yeah, many and many of these things go back to our conversations earlier, that individualist, uh, individual, individualistic approach, having that conversation and making sure we're addressing what the needs are at the beginning of the encounters. Um, that might also apply to our next question. Which visitation <laughs> method uh, would be best for a person with limited health literacy and or particular learning style. Telehealth doesn't seem like the best options for those with limited health literacy or more hands-on learning style. Which type of visit is most appropriate for a person with limited health literacy? How do you best engage a person with limited health literacy via telehealth? Okay, so that comes with, again, having that conversation. I know I kind of sound like I'm repeating myself, but yeah. it has, comes with having that conversation, engaging the family member. And that's one of the things that we do in the CCBHC model is a patient and family-centered approach. So, and I know there are instances that sometimes family members may not be available, but again, it's going to take a lot of case management on that. So there's not like a specific answer for that, but it goes back to making sure that we're doing the best we can to address those social determinants. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think in addition to health literacy, also thinking of the um, uh, tech, uh, technological literacy as well, or the digital literacy. Um, so for, for someone who uh, may be of low health literacy, may also be of um, uh, low uh, digital literacy. And so making sure that you um, um, have a better understanding of what their needs are um, and, and making sure that they're met either in person or through telehealth. A major question I ask is how can 
I, how can we help you be successful? What do you need? That open-ended question is not a yes or no answer. So you get more information that way. Um, for you, Dr. Hicks, you mentioned sometimes you want the patient to come into the office for mental health patients. In what instances would you want to see them in person? So for example, if, if there's a client who we're, um, and this is not to, um, to, to have a punitive effect, but there are some instances where we have a client that may be dealing with substance use disorder. And there are some things that we have to do in the offices and conversations that we have to have in the office to make sure that they're being successful or that client who is in a acute crisis with their mental health, that we have to come in and uh, have them come in and do an assessment and have some specific conversations and make sure that we're addressing their needs. Um, I think they're also asking you, Eric. I'm not sure this is a yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I think it uh, you know it really um, sort of depends. I mean, obviously, a lot of the um, uh, things that may require you know lab work or things like that, you you certainly would need to make sure um, you have someone um, uh, uh, come in. Um, and there may be certain conditions where um, you know the the touching and feeling and and those types of things are going to be um uh really really important um with that said um technology does continue to advance um, one of the things that we had heard um particularly as it relates to um uh, skin conditions is that um there were things that couldn't have been done through telehealth visits even five years ago but now with um you know very high resolution cameras for a, a pretty inexpensive price uh, that are built right into your laptops they're able to do it now. And so I think really making sure that we are kind of continuing to um, uh, evaluate and, and institute what are those types of services that can be done through telehealth and which ones are not, I think will be really important. Um, there was also a, a question earlier that I saw, I can't remember if it was in the chat or the Q&A, about remote patient monitoring. Um, so that's another area where I think that technology continues to evolve. So, um, you know, I would say that's should be seen. So things like, for those who aren't aware, that would be things like, um, you know, uh, remote monitoring of, of blood pressure or um, uh, your A1C. Um, you know, that these are things that you know are continuing to get better and better, and can be a helpful tool in the toolbox. Um, certainly, don't want to um, say that it's always going to be um, suitable for people. Um, you know, they may not want to, you know, wear a tracker at all times and have their information shared um, across cyberspace. Um, but I, I think really having that conversation with the patient and say, would you rather do this and come in less frequently? Um, maybe a, a great way to go. And I know um, we've also seen a, a huge uptick in the use of them in clinical trials as well. Um, so as, as we think about the, the next generation of medicines, um, I think there's a, a great opportunity to use these types of tools. But again, really making sure that as we're looking to bring in um, you know, a diverse uh, clinical trial population, that we are having those conversations to see if that is something that would be useful for them or would they rather come into a site more frequently? Oh, yes. And, and in this space, too, it's very important that um, we we not work in silos, right? So that case management piece, like if the, if the client has home health coming, integrating services with those those providers as well. So, you know, just utilizing all the services we have out there, that teamwork approach is going to be very important. And again, technology, we're, we're advancing. So taking advantage of that. Yeah. One other thing that I just remembered to um, it, when thinking about why you don't have someone come in or, or, or not. Um, one of the things that we had heard from uh, a kidney group was um, in talking to um, their patients about in-home dialysis versus going to a dialysis center. There were not an insignificant number of people who said they would prefer to continue going into the dialysis center because they had a community of other dialysis uh, um, uh, people getting dialysis as well. And so by bringing it into the home, um, you know, particularly someone who maybe doesn't have a, a lot of social stimulation in their daily lives, um, that was one place where they where they found it. Um, so not sort of forcing someone to doing it at home if they actually wanted to be uh, amongst their um, what they see as their community. So that's another thing to really consider as you have these conversations with people to, to determine what they would prefer. Thank you. Thank the both of you. Um, so we are approaching the end of our hour. 
I want to thank Dr. Tracy Hicks and Eric Gosho for spending part of their Friday with us and for sharing some of the important work they're doing. Um, before we go from the both of you, are there any final words or takeaways you'd like to share? Um, I would just say that I am honored to have the privilege to speak to everyone today. Again, thank you for the gift of your time and always patient preference is key for me, having those conversations and meeting them where they are. I couldn't say either of those things any better, um, so I won't try and just say uh, thank you so much for having me today and hope everyone has a, uh, a wonderful weekend and uh, a holiday season. Happy okay. holidays. Thanks. Thanks again to the both of you. Um, so we're going to give the attendees about five minutes of their time back. Uh, we hope everyone enjoys a safe, healthy, and happy holiday with your loved ones. And thanks again. Great. Thank you. Thank you.